Right. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the I've Heard of Her discussion series. We're doing a mini social distancing isolation quarantine edition. <laughs> we are currently working from home. Um, so that is why we are awkwardly in little boxes on your screen instead of in the museum right now. Uh, today we are going to be talking about Belle Boyd. Spoiler alert, she was a Confederate spy. So we're very excited to be able to bring you this story. Um, so I guess we should introduce ourselves. Um, we have a page for this. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm Jen Edgington. I'm curator of social studies education um, at the Kenosha Public Museums. And so I'm at all three museums. And I am Samantha Mahalik. I'm the registrar also at the Kenosha Public Museums. Um, I work in the collection and exhibits department um, with helping with the care and management of the collection. Um, so I am very excited about this. Um, Jen, you wanna talk about why we do this program? Absolutely. So this program mainly is at our museum. This is our first offsite one, like Samantha was saying. It's an hour long program, the third Thursday of the month at noon. It's a free program. So when the museum is back open, we will be doing this program because we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. So we want to make sure that women's stories are told and highlighted throughout um, the year in particular. So I've heard of her was kind of born out of that. Right? Let's start. Let's ready? Let's go. I'm ready. All right. So we're going to talk about Maria Isabel or Belle Boyd today. Um, and just a little bit about her. So Elizabeth was born on May 9th, 1844 in Martinsburg, Virginia, which is now West Virginia. She was born to affluent tobacco farmer, parents. They were wealthy. They were of Scottish descent. Um, her dad's name was Benjamin Reed Boyd and her mom was Mary Rebecca Glenn Boyd. So um, she grew up kind of a tomboy. She uh, was really headstrong and she was also very spoiled by her parents. Um, there's one family Lord, we don't know how true this is, but she was not invited to a family dinner at age 11 because she was too young. So the story goes that she actually crashed the dinner party, party riding her horse into the room and allegedly said, my horse is old enough, isn't he? So um, a little sass, I would say. <laughs> on her um, throughout her childhood. She did go to Mount Washington Female College at age 12 and she graduated from there at 16. So um, just to put it in context, she's 17 years old when the Civil War breaks out. So right before the Civil War, she's um, exiting her her female college and um, she's living in DC as a debutante. So she's not really working per se, but um, she's very involved in social um, programming. And this is just a highlight of everything I just said. <laughs> Another nice picture. Very beautiful. So although, she said, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I said very beautiful, although her, con her contemporaries did not describe her as beautiful. She was said that she had a nice shape and she was very tall, but Never said she had a pretty face. Just throwing that out there. Oh, whoa. oh well. Very rude, I know. <laughs> right, like bad to her. And she was 17 years old when the war broke out. And right away her father enlists in the Confederacy. He's 45 years old when he enlists. So in average, that's a little older, especially Union soldiers are in their, t the average age is 20. Of course, there's outliers in there, but he's a little older. Um, three family members that we know of are convicted of being Confederate spies. So this household is a Confederate household. Um, and she originally starts by helping to raise money for the Confederate cause. That's not enough for her. And, um, She's back in her house and um, there's the, her hometown is starting to fall to the Union. And while um, the Union soldiers are around, one goes into her house. And um, 
there's different stories on what exactly happened. Her memoirs say it one way, other sources say it a different way. But um, a Union soldier, possibly drunk, broke into their house and assaulted her mother. That might be verbally according to her memoirs, or it might be physically too. So in her memoirs, she um, she says that it was verbally, and so she actually ends up shooting and killing him on the spot. So um, that what she says in her memoirs is he addressed my mother and myself in a language as offensive as possible to conceive i can stand it no longer we ladies are obliged to go arm in order to protect ourselves as best we might from insult or an outrage she's acquitted of the crime they don't see it as a crime but the south sees it as an act of heroism and she's kind of wins their graces um so when she Returns home, she starts her career in espionage, working with P.T. Beauregard and Stonewall Jackson to start um, passing messages. Okay, yes. So that's kind of how she got in the game. Um, so by late 1861, she was already caught uh, for the first time. Um, she had a message in her own handwriting and signed it Bell which does not seem very sneaky or smart in any way. Like, wouldn't you try and mask your handwriting or get a nom de plume or something? But I don't know, I, I guess I've seen more spy movies than she has. Uh, her mom was worried about the situation, but Belle was let go. Um, she was sent to live with her relatives, didn't work. She kept on right on spying. Um, among her most more famous exploits, um, on May 23rd, 1862, in Fort uh, Royal, Virginia, she listened through a knot hole uh, in a hotel room where on the other side of the wall were several Union soldiers. Um, so she tried to listen to what they were talking about um, and try and get a, a beat on their plans. So she rode between the two armies to deliver the message uh, to a staff officer her efforts um, helped secure a Confederate victory that day. She actually got the plan right. Um, and her memoirs claim she received a thank you note from Stonewall Jackson, a personal note um, for this exploit. We don't know, her memoir is a tricky thing, right? We don't know how much of it is actually true. A lot of it seems a little bit exaggerated, um, but, Stonewall himself for this specific exploit did thank her. Uh, we don't know if it was a personal note or if he just said it in general, like, oh, there was this spy that helped us. But this one seems to be true. So her spy exploits actually were helping the Confederacy. Um, and so by 1862, especially after this exploit, Union newspapers gave her several nicknames, which you can see listed on the screen. Um, my favorite, honestly, might be the Siren of Shenandoah or Cleopatra of Succession. I like that. <laughs> I love, I just, uh, they're ridiculous. So how she got her info, a lot of times, besides listening through knot holes, was she flirted, flirted with all the Union soldiers she could find um, because she was in what is now West Virginia. Um, they're in a Union area, right? So there's Union soldiers everywhere. She flirted with them to try and get info. She really took advantage of a, the world that she was living in, where men um, gave deference to women. Women couldn't be dangerous. They had to be Victorian gentlemen. Um, and so this was a situation that she really took advantage of. Um, so, but... At the same time, even though she was successful, she also definitely got arrested a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to really quick mention that all of those nicknames are so romanticized. Mm -hmm. um, just, they're very, if we go back, um, they're, like you were saying, they're very kind of funny to us now, but back then they were very romanticized and really put her in this, um, kind of romantic light and she knew what she was doing. She was flirting. She was being that, um, the Cleopatra, that siren. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. as for the arrests, uh, she was arrested six times in prison, three of those times and exiled twice. 
during this time, she didn't go easy. <laughs> um, she sang Dixie in jail. She waved a Confederate flag from her window and she devised a way to communicate um, with outsiders using a rubber ball. So she would put messages in a ball and throw it out the window. And um, that was her way of communicating. So she really, yeah, she was yeah. an interesting lady. She definitely was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she also, she got married three times. So in 1864, she married a Union Naval officer, Samuel, and um, they had a daughter. And her marriage was short-lived because he either died or left um, before the daughter was born. It was kind of unsure, um, different things on different ones. He, during this time, she is in England. So remember, she's exiled. So she's living in England. This Union soldier is over in England with her. Um, there's reports that maybe he went back to the United States and flipped to the Confederacy because of her. There's another one that maybe he's in jail. Or there's a third one, he died in England. So we don't really know. And then <laughs> there, so she ends up, that man is, is out of the picture one way or another. Um, and then she moves back to the United States. She writes her memoirs before she moves back, Belle Boyd in camp and prison in 1865. Um, after the war, she becomes an actress, which we'll talk about. And she moves back to the States in 1866. And she marries another Union officer, and this one, John Hammond in 1869. So she loved Union soldiers. Um, somehow, but um, they have four children and they divorce in 1884. She's not done marrying though, not yet. She actually, months after divorcing, so just months, she marries an actor, Nathaniel High, who is 17 younger, years younger than her. And so um, they go on acting. Yes, so at this time, she returns to acting and she um, starts to pro pro portray, how about that word, herself <laughs> as, in the Civil War. Um, she really hams it up, portrays herself as this great, brave woman, um, which like I said, from based on her memoirs, not surprising at all that she would act that way. Um, well, she, did some, she did some really great, brave things too. She did, she mm -hmm. did. Definitely. Um, I mean, running onto a battlefield to give information for your side, that is brave. I yeah, mean, absolutely. I don't know that I would want to run onto a battlefield at all. <laughs> 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 um, but anyway, so she's touring with her husband right now. Um, and actually, she is buried in Wisconsin because mm -hmm. as they were touring um, near the Wisconsin Dells, she actually dies of a heart attack. Um, in 1900. She was only 56 years old um, and she's buried in Spring Grove Cemetery and this is a picture of her gravesite. Um, and there's a little plaque there describing uh, what she did during the war um, and you can it's still there you can go see it today. Um, so it's, it's kind of a weird twist that this great uh, you know proponent of the Confederacy ended up marrying all these union soldiers and then <laughs> being buried in the union. <laughs> yeah, well, for the longest time, her gravesite didn't really have a headstone at all. It just kind of said her name. But if you notice at the bottom here, um, 1976, I believe, I think that's what mm -hmm. it is. So um, before that, it just kind of was an empty plaque, basically, not really any landmark status, which is interesting. I mean, yeah, that, I wonder, that now this is going to be a tangent, but 76, that would be around the time that uh, historians really started paying attention to women's history with that second wave of feminism. I wonder if that's a part of it. We did not look into this. That's just a random question I thought of right now. <laughs> We're in a, a smaller normal, you know, if we had our large program, we could look into that more. Exactly. <laughs> Well, if you've ever been to one of our programs before, you know that we like to ask questions. We like to engage with the audience. We obviously can't do that now because you're watching us on 
on our Zoom call here. So we're hoping that you can answer some of these questions in the comment section. Um, we'd like to keep this discussion going so that hopefully when we're back, when the museum opens, we can keep doing this great program and having these fantastic discussions. So our first question for you is how did Boyd challenge the 19th century gender roles? Excuse me. So it's really, I think for me, looking at, she took something that was so um, kind of reserved for men and broke that role, but then also played into it because again, she flirted. She got her information by that romanticizing what spy life is like, but then she did, you know, go out on those battlefields like you're talking about. So I think that there's a lot of dimension when we come to gender roles of the 19th century and Belle Boyd over here. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so what our second question for you guys today is what kind of career do you think Boyd would have today? Um, I don't know. I don't know if she'd be a spy or not. I personally thought of she would be an Instagram influencer. <laughs> I think that she was really good at um, getting people to do what she wanted them to do mm -hmm. and kind of being like pretty and, you know, I don't know, but doing it. Practical? You know? Ask? Yeah. I get like, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So answer our, in the social media post, please. We'd love to see what you guys think. Um, this is also a reason why this is a mini-sode. We did not want to ramble at you for 45 minutes. Our program really is centers on audience participation. We'd love to see what you guys think. Um, everybody's mind is different, and we always have such great conversations when we have this. So please, let's, uh, let's try and make the conversation digital this time. Absolutely. And um, our next one will also be an online Minnesota, um, and that will be Margaret Mead. So kind of the, the mother of anthropology. We're really, I'm really excited to talk about her because my background is in anthropology. Um, so this one will be also on social media. And then hopefully our June one, which will be Jane Adams, we'll be back in person. So we hope fingers to see you crossed. then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> fingers crossed for sure. We just want to end with one thing. Um, even though our doors are closed, our mission is more critical than ever. We continue to develop educational videos, guides, and live streaming programs like this one or Museum Munchkins. Because we know how important it is for our community to have access to these educational opportunities and to explore their curiosities, please consider donating. With your help, we can get through this time together. Go to www.kenoshapublicmuseum.org and click donate. Thank you so much for listening and we hope that Thanks. you join us next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, perfect.